World Economic Forum, and I'm I'm very excited about this session. Actually, this is a a topic that's very close to my heart, as I have children, as many people do, and this is the number one issue, I think, parenting issue of the 21st century. We're here to talk about uh, uh, digital intelligence, and I'm very pleased to introduce our participants this morning. We have Park Yushun, the founder and chief digital officer of the uh, DQ Institute, and Janil Puttucheri, the senior minister of Ta state, and the uh, at the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Communication and Information in Singapore. Uh, good morning and good morning. thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I might uh, turn to the Yushun to, to start and give us an introduction to the scale of the problem and some of the challenges that parents and education, educators and societies face in this new world of digital information. Sure. Um, one thing that I want to start with is that you know, our children are very unique generations. So they're first generation who are born and raised in this hyper-connected internet world. So iPad is their nanny, and they live together with the digital world. And another interesting thing is that they're actually born and raised, the first generation, in this fourth industrial revolution. So now we are in the stage that the digital technology really going fast in exponential growth, where the system and education and culture cannot really catch up with the speed. So in the midst, we have great potential we discussed today and yesterday and day before yesterday about the ASEAN growing to digital economy and huge potential that we are getting by um, having the more and more youth and individual on the internet connection. So we are looking at the huge promise thanks to the digital technology. But at the same time, we have to be mindful of the side effect of digital technology. The Professor Sharp mentioned that this new technology and fourth industrial revolution can bring both promise, but at the same, at the peril. So what would be the peril? So AI taking over the humankind, or uh, there will be no job for our children. But I believe the true peril is that in you know, a lack of humanity in the digital world. If you look at the digital world right now, there's a lots of great things going on, but at the same time, there's a lots of danger that our children can face. Um, if you look at the worldwide statistic, 90% um, of children have come across with the hatreds, bigotry, racist um, comments and contents in the internet. And also, around 40% of children around the world have experienced cyberbullying, and 10% of children can be diagnosed as pathological game and internet users. It is not a surprising fact that you know, we are seeing the social media has been used for online radicalization, grooming, and all other side effects. Of course, these are the one dimension of a digital technology, but unless we are mindful of these challenges, uh, we cannot really maximize our, our potential Thank you very much. Um, Minister, can, um, can you tell us a little bit about how the Singaporean Ministry of Education, for instance, is integrating some of these ideas and challenges into its policy program? Well, the first uh, position is uh, how, how big a role is this going to play in our education space going forward? And do we have the luxury of saying, well, we might be in a position to restrict or reduce access or uh, mitigate uh, some of the downsides. And, and the reality, we believe, is no, because the opportunities available in terms of uh, both the education space, but the job space and the social space, uh, with what happens online and digital space, uh, are huge. And the generation growing up today, they're going to be very much Taking, up, taking, up, taking advantage of these opportunities. It's going to be very much part of their lives. And so we take the position that we have to embrace it and we have to teach the children how to embrace it in a positive way, uh, that they need to be able to learn to navigate 
the downsides and the risks. In the same way that there are downsides and risks with every medium of communication, and you know, television was no different, and radio was no different, and print was no different. It's just the speed and the scale and the ease of access and the, the, the affordability of the digital revolution that's making it seem like a quantum leap. We, at the same time, uh, social-wise, society-wide in Singapore, we, we, we do take the position that there are some things that we can't countenance uh, regardless of the medium that it would be transmitted across. And we have developed a series of uh, legislative and regulatory tools so that we can police our internet. And we, we, make, no, uh, uh, we make no bones about it. We, we, we don't have to apologize for this. Uh, if there is hate speech, we want to be able to go and do something about it, uh, regardless of whether that hate speech is on a flyer or a book or on the internet and in, in one of our local uh, sites. Now, if we then move away from that and we think about how that pans out in terms of an education approach, we, we feel that uh, the use of these technologies needs to be pervasive within our education space so that the children are familiar with it. The more unfamiliar it is, the more it becomes a, a special treat or an exotic part of their education, uh, the, the more open that it's going to be to uh, misuse, disuse and abuse. The more that they use it as a matter of course, they will learn those self, uh, self-regulatory skills. You know that they will have uh, a sense of what is normal and abnormal in their in their interactions. The best protection to whether it's a scam or a phishing email or hate speech or abuse is a sense of self-worth and a sense of self-confidence at using these tools and a sense of normality. Uh, when you don't have that sense, you become much 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 more vulnerable. So we have an approach that the use of ICT is something that we should see as pervasive, not in its own, for its own sake, but because it allows so much else to happen within the education space. Uh, having said that, we separate that out from the teaching of computational skills, quantitative reasoning, uh, critical analysis, which doesn't automatically need to be on an online platform or a digital platform in order to be effective. And we want to give our teaching staff, our professional staff in the space, a fair amount of leeway and autonomy to find the best tool, be it digital or pen and paper, in order to teach those skills. But that over time, overwhelmingly, there will be an increase in the use of ICT in the education space. And that's only for a good thing. Yeah. Now, the next tier is then a series of formal programs to educate our children on how to use the internet and the digital tools responsibly. Uh, a lot of that revolves around uh, critical thinking, uh, being uh, a little bit skeptical about what you read, as you should be regardless of where you're getting that information. You need to think about it for yourself. And there's a whole series of modules and programs and approaches we have. Uh, and then a separate layer, which is the, the peer influence. And I think particularly for the young, peer influence is a very important part of how they learn. And, and that should be no different uh, in this space that there should be some degree of uh, peer interaction and peer support, that it shouldn't really uh, be a, uh, by fiat or by diktat. Interestingly, what we've seen in Singapore over the last uh, five, seven years is an increasing number of people who are coming out online in the social media space using their own names, not as avatars and trolls, but using their own names to defend a moderate position uh, where there has been uh, instances of public shaming or public cyberbullying. We, 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 we are now seeing this where people will come out using their own identifiable online persona uh, and to speak up on behalf of a moderate, inclusive stance online. Yeah. And I think that socialization of that normal approach is what will ultimately help us uh, over time, that we take some of the things that we, we're going to talk about in terms of DQ, and it becomes a, a very much more social approach that everybody participates, and that will give us some online resilience uh, to, these, to these negative factors. So, so in terms of that second layer, which you mentioned, which is the actual formal programs for teaching of digital intelligence. Yushin, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about uh, about the concept of DQ that you have developed and how parents and children and teachers and others can access these ideas. Sure. Um, Janil uh, described really well about what has to be taught for our children. We want our children to be an independent thinker who can make a decision in online, right decision, and with a critical thinking. So we want them to be a, a proactive learner and doers, so who can actively reach out to the community and also utilize the, maximum, uh, the technology in a most effective way and maximize the potential while mitigating the risk. So these are the 
ability that we want to nurture in our children. So we, um, as a group of researchers, develop um, what would be the core skills, life skills that children need to have. So we DQ, digital intelligence, is some of cognitive, social, and emotional ability that child and individual can deal with the demands and threats of digital technology and media. So um, what we have done is uh, very interesting. Um, we are looking at the, the generations of children. So who are the target? The, who will be the most effective target in intervention time that we can go and talk to them about the skills? So we concluded 9 to 12 because these are the age group. They started their uh, digital life most actively. So they get the first device around the 9 or 10, and they become very active in the social media, even though they're not supposed to be on social media until 13 and above. Uh, but that's the reality, because they're, they are the age that's seeking the social inclusion. They need a peer pressure. Um, they, need a, um, they need to influence and get influenced through the social media. So what we believe is that, just like a um, driving license, before you drive, before he had hit the road, you know how to drive. So DQ Education has a similar, top, similar uh, rational. Before you get uh, very actively involved in social media and digital media and technology, you know how to use them safely, effectively, and responsibly. That is the starting point of DQ. We work with, very closely with the uh, Singapore government um, and um, private sector, Singtel, is our, was our strategic partner. And we also work with the civic partners. In Touch Cyber Wellness, our, the, um, our partners in Singapore, we formed the coalition to make what is the most effective way to reach out to whole generation of 8 to 12 years old. Because we really believe that this is a core competency that every child needs to have. And it is not just about every child. Also, it's very important to reach out to children in the uh, low, uh, under, underprivileged community because there is a data showing that children in low socioeconomical status can have a higher impact on the cyber risk. So what we develop is the online platform, yeah? that can, children, any child can self-learn DQ by themselves in a holistic way with the minimal efforts of teachers and parents because digital issues are very tricky. Because it, like we say, they are the first generation who are born and raised in this internal generation. So teachers and parents are usually feel empowerless. So they, are not, they feel incompetent to talk about this digital issue. So it is often neglected in the schools or parenting. So what we do is that we make it all self-learning. And number two, what we did is that we made assessment tools. So we are first group who developed the assessment tools for digital skills and digital citizenship skills. The reason it was so important is that since there was no measurement, teachers and parents do not feel the gravity of this importance. And it's very hard to teach, them one, teach our children one step to another unless there's a feedback coming back to them. So we made all this into an online platform, and we did a rigorous study um, together with uh, Singaporean schools and Ministry of Education, and we had a great result. So um, our program has proven that 10% of increment of DQ score, which can lead to about 30 to 40% of reduction on cyber risk and enhancement of future readiness skills such as literacy, future readiness, um, global citizenship, and empathy, and others. Um, we are very privileged to announce and publish our result at this year Davos, and we are ready to actually provide this free and tested program to the nations. So we are launching a new initiative called DQ Every Child, which is a global movement um, in collaboration with the World Economic Forum and other partners. So what we believe that this is education for really all children, one billion of children who is coming to the internet world. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, if, I'm very pleased to take any questions from the audience if uh, just kind of let me know. But as, as um, 
uh, I'll turn to, again to the minister and um, some of these. So there's clearly the message I was hearing from you is that uh, digital intelligence is something that children should that should be integrated into sort of in the normal flow of education. <coughs> that digital devices exist and that children should, uh, uh, through socialization and their educational programs, become familiar with behavior in the same way that they, that they do in the, in, the, in the playground. That's, um, uh, are there any curriculum uh, items or uh, policies that specifically address these new kind of information overload and other, other challenges that you can think that the government might wish to explore? Well, our approach to the from the curriculum side, our approach is uh, again tiered and layered. Uh, we expect uh, at the primary school level, uh, certainly for the for the younger kids, that there'll be a very significant uh, part of their math and science curriculum, which revolves around computational skills, quantitative reasoning, critical thinking. Uh, now, that may or may not be done using a digital and online platform, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. But we're separating out the curricular aims from the tools being used to deliver. That's our expectation. At the same time, at our primary school, we have uh, a pervasive expectation that there'll be exposure to using computers and tablets and online tools for a wide variety of subjects, including uh, you know, social sciences, history, language, and so on and so forth. So we separate out the curricular aims from the platforms and tools that, are, that, are, that we're expecting. But on both levels, we, we are hoping there's a very high pervasiveness of ICT uh, and computer-related skills as well as platforms. Now, then as we, as we progress throughout our educational system, we then have uh, in the senior primary an opportunity for some students to then develop that further and take on computing coding, uh, computer science projects, robotics, and so forth. Uh, and at the secondary school level, a uh, significant proportion of our secondary schools will uh, offer an applied learning program in science or STEM-related subjects, or math-related subjects, or computer science-related subjects. And all of those are then opportunities and platforms to, for them to start learning and dealing with these skills of dealing with the digital online world, uh, information overload, and so forth. We're also offering O-levels in computer science and A-levels in computer science. And so we have a tiered approach as we progress through our educational system. So everybody gets a certain exposure, certain significant exposure, both to the skills as well as the tools. And there are opportunities throughout for you to deepen those if you if you so wish and if it's something that you have an aptitude for. We're not teaching everybody how to code, but we are expecting that everybody will learn the cognitive skills, computational thinking, cognitive, uh, quantitative reasoning, the scientific method. And that's something everybody needs to, to learn, but not necessarily learn how to code. But we want to make it possible for everybody to learn how to code should they wish to. Now, if I then circle back to the, uh, the social impact of this, information overload was the, was the term that you used. That's not a single discrete subject. In the same way that we're separating out the curricular outcomes from the platforms, uh, these sort of uh, higher order skills, how to deal with information, how to be critical about the information you receive from various sources, how to fact check and cross corroborate uh, the data that you're receiving, that's pervasive across a number of subjects. That's not just an ICT subject. I mean, it needs to happen in history, it needs to happen in social sciences, it needs to happen in language. And so that comes down to our pedagogical approach and how we are training our teachers to think about the extent to which our children have access to knowledge way over what they're provided in the textbook. To what extent are our teachers bringing in uh, internet resources into their classroom? Are they making the, the URLs to the YouTube video as prominent a uh, teaching resource as a chapter in their textbook? Uh, and so our approach to these things is now uh, to look at how we train our teachers, both uh, pre-service and in-service. So it's a professional development issue around the pedagogical tools that our teachers can bring to bear. And it cuts, cuts across all our subjects how to deal with information, sources of information. And we're quite open to the fact that our teachers need not develop all their information de novo themselves. And we are very um, uh, supportive of the idea that they should scour the internet and if someone has done a YouTube video better than any, any of us, that's the thing that they should use as a teaching resource. And that approach means that the skills that we're talking about become normalized and socialized for our teachers and then they can do so for the children under their care. And, and that is how we, we think there's a way forward. Yeah, so um, what I'm hearing uh, from Jamil is that uh, it's integrated throughout the curriculum. 
you should you think that DQ is something that actually you need to it's it's a different subject altogether that it's something that you need to address in a particular time frame uh, with particular tools um, currently like Singapore is uh, one of the frontier nation who is working on the DQ topics so they have developed a um, curriculum called cyber wellness and it is one of few countries around the world I can say who have frontiering this as put it in a national uh, education curriculum and a separate set of, set aside of uh, these topics and dedicate time to teach them about the cyber wellness so I can say that Singapore is quite advanced on their regard and one thing I found that is quite fascinating is that Singapore has done not just about the national curriculum, they encourage to bring the social sectors as well as the uh, uh, industry sectors to bring in the best knowledge. So they formed the interministerial committee to look after cyber wellness issue and to bring the partners uh, like us to be part of the game. So. Um, one thing that I really admire, and I think it can be benchmarked by the other nations, is that how the Singapore government has uh, formed the private and public relationship and partnership to create the ecosystem, rather than it's just not about the one-time uh, curriculum. It also nurtures the ecosystem and culture in the society. So involving education, not just educators, teachers, and students, they involve with of parents and they involve with in counseling so it's it's just beyond the education it's more about the also community effort so that is something that I'd like to complement in about the Singapore approach of uh, dealing with the DQ education um, and we regarding your question my personal view is yes because nowadays um, it is not no longer about math and science. It's more about what is a future skill that we want to nurture. The key critical component of uh, digital de intelligence is a critical thinking. Critical thinking can be born from multiple subjects, and it has to be thinking about the new curriculum, future of curriculum should thinking about how we can integrate it as you, and then we can help children to think about how to solve the really global agenda and global challenges. So along that line, I, I think you know, we are moving into that direction. Very good. Michael, if I could just add, sure. circling back to your question about uh, you're hearing that it's pervasive or is there some discrete time, it's, it's not, those are not mutually exclusive. When we talk about the, the skills uh, that Dr. Park just talked about in terms of uh, uh, critical thinking, the higher order skills, uh, whether it's critical thinking, uh, relationship building, uh, presentation skills, these can't be taught in a vacuum. They, they have to be taught about something. They have to be taught within the context of something. You have to have something to think critically about. Mm -hmm. uh, and so whether this approach is pervasive throughout the curriculum or you have time set aside, it's not an either or approach. And, our approach is that you need to do both. You need dedicated time, especially at the lower primary level, and the kid hasn't been introduced to some of these concepts. You need to have some dedicated curricular time to pull out and, and think about these problems and these, these challenges. But then you need to take those concepts and layer them throughout a whole bunch of other subjects so that they have something to do with these new skills that they have. Mm -hmm. It's not an either-or approach, it's both. Mm -hmm. And it's only then that you get those real synergies across uh, both the skills and the subjects that those skills are brought to bear upon. That makes great sense. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a bit about Singapore mm -hmm. uh, and we've uh, touched upon the work of the DQ Institute. How do we transfer these ideas globally? Um, thank you for the question because uh, that's you, what I'm that very one. passionate about. Um, I, I um, personally believe that you know, how we can actually change the generation because these are the really unique generation that has a really high hope. And they have a sh so much um, potential compared to other generations because of the technology they have at hand. So what we want to do is that anybody, any child around the world come to the, uh, this digital space, they just need to know the basic of DQ. That means how to be online, it's how to become a good digital citizen. So in order for us to um, help the nations, we actually devised this uh, 
very simple to use, simple plug and play online uh, platform to the nations. So three bottlenecks that usually the nation have to implement this digital uh, intelligence education. First, teachers not empowered. Either they don't know about importance in other nations, in some nations, and or they don't have uh, resources or tools or training to teach this topic to other children. The second, the lack of framework and curricula and problems as well as assessment. So in order for a nation to develop all this, it takes a lot of time. So what we actually provide is an easy to plug and play uh, solution so they can actually bring it without any cost. So third is about the system is not ready. So just to be sure, um, um, there's few nations who are having this uh, digital intelligence as national curriculum. Um, so just bypassing all this, uh, um, the bottlenecks, what we actually provide is a nation, any child and any teachers around the world can utilize our platform to learn DQ and get the assessment. So what we are planning to do in 2017, uh, is it 17, right? To yeah. <laughs> this year. Yes, That's we right. are going to more than 10 countries this year. Um, currently in our system already, the schools from the 67 uh, countries are using our system already. But we are going to go very systematic way to work for government, um, more than 10 countries this year. And we are planning to publish the first DQ Global Index report in collaboration with the World Economic Forum uh, next year. Our goal is to set a global standard for digital protection and digital citizenship skills, digital intelligence skills for children, so that when we set the global standard, all the countries can benefit it through this system. And also, um, our aspiration is to really go to more than 150 countries within three years. So we are happy to work with anyone who have the same mission and same goal with us. So I will want to invite everyone for the collaboration. Fantastic. Well, uh, Janil, hearing the collaboration that's happening here, uh, no doubt Singapore will score highly on the, on the, on the DQ. Perhaps uh, you could give us some final closing thoughts on, on developing these skills. Well, I think uh, I'd return to where I started. These are going to be essential for the kids uh, to be able to navigate the space. And the reality is that many kids will pick this up on their own. This will become very much part of their social life, but we have to look out for those who are most vulnerable, either because they have, uh, haven't had the means or the opportunity to, to, to learn these skills or to get online, or where they are growing up in an environment where they're very exposed to, a, to being groomed or to being manipulated by what they see online. So I think, yes, the, the, the generation is going to grow up and Many of them will pick up these things on their own and eventually find their way, but along the way, will they leave people behind or will they uh, have a rough ride getting there? And this is the kind of thing that we have to do to intervene to make sure that all children get the same opportunity to, to develop these, what are going to be fundamental skills as they grow up into becoming adults. Indeed. Uh, and if you could just give us the website address so that people watching can go there and check out the online tools. Sure. So if you have any, uh, if you have children of your own, or if you're teachers, uh, visit us at uh, dqworld.net. So you will find a very cartoonish um, animation for children. Um, yep. Great. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for coming along, and thanks to those who are watching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank right. you.